I know there are still evil people around, and I know there are very good people. I think for mankind to su survive, we have to think positively, and it's very important. Uh, I think as one gets older, one can get more negative. Um, I've seen it on other people, uh, but it's very important to believe in the goodness of mankind. We, we have that innate quality to be good and to help other people. My name is Ellie Bolograf and I was born on September the 19th, 1940. My birth certificate reads Ellie Dwinger. I come from a traditional Jewish uh, Orthodox family. Uh, that was at least before the war. Things uh, changed uh, in many ways after the war. My mother's family lived in Leeuwarden, where my, her father was a professional photographer and a uh, very well-known one. He photographed all the school children. He had clientele coming to the studio who'd had their portraits taken there. And they were a well-established Jewish family who had been there. I think the Dutch Jews have lived in Holland for about 400 years or so. And, and these, this, my family lived in that northern Holland in Leeuwarden, in the province of Friesland. And, um, my mother's uh, family are the Cohens, and my father's, uh, my mother's fa uh, father's family, his name is Dwinger, last name, but it was changed from Levy to Dwinger. So we had the Levy and the Cohens <laughs> in our family. Uh, so that was my uh, mother's family. Um, uh, before the war, they were very well settled there. There was no problem. Um, as I said, they uh, were Orthodox. Uh, it was shul on Shabbos, and it was Jewish school, and it was... Uh, my mother went to a regular uh, ladies' school, um, but uh, she also went to Jewish school. So uh, when I was a little kid, of course, I was expected to follow the same kind of pattern. And as far as my biological father's uh, uh, family is concerned, they came from uh, Poland, Jeshov, to Essen, Germany. And there they established a, um, they had two shops. There was a, a furniture store and there was a photo refinishing uh, shop where people went and bought, uh, had brought portraits, family, old family portraits that needed to be touched up because they were damaged. So, and they were well established, but um, my biological father, uh, father died early, and so the mother uh, brought up the three sons, one of who was my biological father, Nathan Gruner. I never knew my biological father, and it wasn't really spoken about. And the reason was that he had come to Holland in 1937. He, uh, to escape what was happening in Germany, or because there was oppression from 33 onwards toward Jews. And um, he tried to get himself established in Holland. It was awkward because uh, so many others were doing the same thing. And, um, but he, um, he met my, our family, and uh, somehow met and my mother, and they eventually took a liking to each other. And out of this particular relationship, in 1940, September the 19th, I was born. <clears throat> but the family didn't really uh, want my biological father in the family because he was 11 years older. And my, my, that wasn't very good. You know, a, a man always should be no more than three years older than the wife. When the, the uh, Germany invaded Holland, of course, they bombed uh, um, Rotterdam, and they came from various directions and also from the air, uh, soldiers being dropped out of airplanes. Um, within five days, Holland uh, capitulated because they didn't expect the uh, Germany to invade because uh, Holland had not been invaded in the First World War. Neither was Switzerland and I believe one of the uh, Scandinavian countries. And so, uh, but of course they didn't really trust the situation. So uh, just at the beginning, uh, there were recruits ready to defend Holland. 
Uh, and so it actually did happen that the Germans in, did invade Holland. Once the Germans had invaded, uh, very, very soon the restrictions were put into place, uh, such as there were curfews, the Jews could not shop uh, between uh, certain hours of the day, that usually was near the end of the day, when there was very little food to choose from in the shops. And of course, there were all these specialty shops. There was the, the vegetable uh, dealer and the, with the fruit, and there was the, the butter and cheese person, and you had to hop from sh shop to shop. And at the end of the day, the fresh fruit and vegetables were largely picked over. And uh, so it was rather awkward. And eventually, of course, there were other curfews. So you could not uh, be on the street. Uh, you had to move over, uh, be uh, walk on the side if a German came down the street. Jews could not work for non-Jews and vice versa. So my mother was looking for work in a, a Jewish establishment, and she was hoping to train as a nurse. So um, she became pregnant with me. At the t yes, I do recall she was working at that time at the hospital. Uh, and uh, when she became pregnant, she worked almost to the very end and didn't tell anyone. I think I, I read in her book that she actually took some laxatives so that people wouldn't, couldn't see that she was getting bigger. It was frowned upon, of course, for women to be pregnant um, with, in, with child uh, prior to their marriage. And so my mother didn't tell anyone about it. So she apparently rushed uh, to the hospital to deliver me, I think it was delivered within hours of, of her leaving the hospital. And so that's how I was born. I was born September the 19th, 1940. Uh, but of course, after I was born, she told the family, and um, no one seemed to have suspected or talked about it. But once I was born, I was very well uh, accepted and doted on and uh, loved like all other children. When I was born, it was uh, very awkward because my mother had to continue to work. So uh, she stayed uh, home uh, f uh, with me uh, for six months and then went back to work. And, and she gave me up, uh, actually it was less than six months, it was just a couple of months if I remember correctly. And then she uh, gave me to my auntie. My auntie, uh, Tante Johanna, uh, her husband had been injured at the onset of the war. She was one of those recruits that went to defend Holland. And um, he, 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 as a result, half his leg was had to be amputated. And so he was hospitalized. And my aunt was um, moved out of her house. She was allowed to live in an apartment on the second floor of this big uh, house. And this is, uh, she had two sons, two little boys, Joop and Karel, and this is where my mother uh, was able to bring me while my mother was working. And so whether she was working in the hospital, which hospital, it depends where she was living. Sometimes she lived within the hospital compound. Um, and so this is how uh, we managed to uh, live for a little while. I lived with my uh, auntie Tante Johanna for two years, and uh, the uh, boys were being homeschooled because Jewish children could not go to school anymore. So my aunt would uh, get books and she would help the boys. Uh, of course, it didn't. After the war, it, they had lost five years; they had to sort of start all over again. But at least she had tried to keep them occupied with uh, some of the schooling. And um, in the meantime, I was living with her. And my mother would come and go uh, to come and visit me wherever she was working. She would take him out to come and visit me. All Jews had to wear a star to identify themselves, and they had to wear this star on the front. And, and first of all, they had to purchase the star in a store. They had to pay for something they didn't want to wear. Then they had to, um, it came on a big, bold uh, yard goods, and they had to cut that out and then fold it under and then sew it onto their clothes. And this had to be an all outer clothing. Um, so this was for all adults. As from the younger age group, it started at age six, where the children had to wear the, the star. It had to be very neatly done, otherwise if, if a German saw you wearing something that was not hanging attached properly, you would get reprimanded. And uh, so the housewife had a lot of work to do because she had to sew those things on all the outer clothing of all the members of the family.
I stayed with my aunt for two years. Uh, the reason was because my aunt had two children and she had a husband. The husband was in hospital. One day, my mother happened to be visiting my aunt and um, me, actually. So she was going up the stairs and a man came out of the first floor apartment and this man happened to be a clergyman and he had come to see the lady on the first floor because her husband was ill. And he said to this lady, who is this lady that's going up the stairs? And she said, oh, that's a Jewish lady who's coming to see her little girl. He said, a Jewish woman, what is she doing here? She should be in hiding. Well, of course, that was a very um, interesting comment, but we didn't know anyone who could hide us. Uh, we didn't have, uh, in those days, people weren't skilled to do things that that they were not familiar with. And hiding was something that seemed not normal. And anyway, we wouldn't have known who would hide us. And it was a very risky thing to hide a Jewish person because it was against the law. So um, now, in the meantime, of course, uh, so what happened was this man uh, happened to be a clergyman and, he, and happened to be a Catholic. Now, there were also Protestants who did this. In this case, it was a Catholic priest. And he went to his church. And he knew a member in this congregation, Mr. Jan Canis, who did, uh, who hid Jewish people. And Jan Canis was a very, very prominent person in Amersfoort, where we lived, because he was head of the Telegram Telegraph Communication Network. Um, it was a very prestigious job. He was a director there, and he had five children and a wife. And yet he. He risked his life, and uh, this was so somewhat unusual because it was generally the 20 to 25-year-olds that dared do risque work. And uh, so this man, Jan Canis, came to, um, um, into the picture, and he said to my aunt, um, I'm willing to pr um, place you uh, into hiding. Um, if you know, uh, but you have uh, two boys. She explained, I have two boys. I have the, my little niece here, and he, um, he said, well, I can't place you all in, in the same house, and certainly not that little girl, because children can keep secrets, and they, I, we always place children by themselves. Okay, well, that had to be done, <coughs> and uh, he, she agreed. But she said, I'm not separating myself from my two boys, nor my husband, who is in the hospital. He said, in that case, we're going to have to uh, wait until you get your summons, because I'm not yet ready to help you in, in, in that way, because that is very, very difficult for me to place four members of a family together. I need to find a household that can actually accept that many people at once and also the location because your husband happens to be uh, injured. So when this conversation took place, it took place quite a while before the actual, uh, when we left. Uh, my aunt, when she got her summons in, in the mail, that she was to appear with the instructions to uh, what she was to take with her and how it was going to go, that she was to go to the train station and take her to, uh, would be taken to Westerbork. Um, she went along with all of this. And so it, uh, the, um, uh, this actually then was, uh, when she did get her summons, um, the whole thing went into motion. She let Mr. Jan Canis know that when it was going to happen, and he told her that she should pack a suitcase for all of the, each member of the family, place it outside, of, uh, down on the ground floor at the back of the house, and in, in the meantime, that evening, they would come and pick uh, her up, and her husband would be taken out of the hospital, and her two sons would be taken. I. Uh, was t that evening was taken by Mr. Hagenau uh, to Utrecht, to his house. Uh, he was uh, affiliated with Mr. Jan Canis doing underground work. He owned a car dealership, uh, and he was actually under suspicion by the Nazis. They were wondering about his comings and goings. So he didn't keep me very long, I think a couple of weeks, until he found a place for me. And I was moved three or four times, and subsequently I was taken to uh, Mechelen in South Limburg. But uh, in the meantime, that evening, when my aunt and uncle and two cousins were supposed to be uh, taken away, that vehicle didn't show up. And they stayed up all night and looked through the crack in, uh, of the curtain when it was going to happen. And they knew the signal, what they were to do. And it uh, didn't happen until the following morning. In the meantime, they sent their two little boys to bed. And then uh, the boys got up early. And uh, they all waited. And sure enough, finally, a car came and the door was opened, 
and uh, the signal was given by the man in the car, some hand signal. Um, they uh, as, as arranged, the two little boys walked out of the house and then to the right down the street and they had to wait until the kids got to the end of the block and then they came out and my uncle was in crutches and they got into the car, the car sped off, picked up the two boys and uh, the boys got in and that's how they got away to their first place of hiding with um, a, a man and his two daughters who uh, happened to be uh, vegetarians and my uncle uncle were kept kosher so that's where they started off. My aunt and uncle and their two sons survived the war. It was uh, rather, they had a very difficult time because my uncle being an invalid was requested to, uh, the whole family to sleep in a hole in the ground on the farmland because uh, the searches were done by the Nazis often at night and people became suspicious because sometimes there would be clothing on the line which you didn't expect, children's clothing in a household where there were no children, a skirt of where there was no woman living and that kind of thing. And so uh, there were a number of searches and indeed they had to run at night through the fields, my uncle and crutches, and get down in ditches which were often filled with water and this is how they would spend the day and the night sometimes until the, uh, this farmer would come and say the coast is clear, you can come back. I actually have fairly vivid memories of being with other people. It actually started before I was sent to Mechelen uh, because I was in competition with another child over toys and I remember having to stand in a corner. You know, children want to play and I think uh, that is why uh, eventually they found me <laughs> a place in southern Holland and it um, was thought also I would blend in better because I had very dark curly hair. There, there were coal mines in the area and the coal miners came from Spain and Italy and they all came had dark hair and it was therefore thought this would be better area for me. But it turned out that the family I lived with did not have uh, dark hair at all. It was not curly. In fact, it was poker straight unless it had a, the girls had a permanent. And this was a, um, I mean, I was a total mismatch and it caused a great deal of concern for the family. But um, the woman in the household wanted very much to keep me and her husband found that I was a big danger to the family, which was true because it was punishable by death to hide Jewish people. I uh, certainly uh, learned fear and it was instilled in me. I don't think children are naturally afraid. Uh, they're curious usually uh, because I was told, uh, for example, if I was outside playing to stay behind the hedge. And um, you know, I did play outside uh, because this was a very unusual, it wasn't a normal house. It was a ho little hotel where people came and went. And the, Mrs. Uh, Wetzels, the lady, uh, mother of the, of the brood of children, uh, she was also required to cook in the kitchen. And 
I often therefore spent time in the kitchen with her, and I played for the boys outside. It was very difficult to confine the child, uh, to confine one. And I remember when the boys went to uh, to get sugar cubes from the Germans that sat in the valley uh, against the bar, and I remember that clearly. I was told not to come out of the, from the hedge. I could peer th through, and then when they reappeared, they would share the, the sugar cubes with me. I definitely learned fear. I do not remember the why. I do remember that I wet my bed for 11 years after the war. I was a very insecure child. Moving around, one, I moved around a lot, but I, you can instill fear in a child. You know, you can talk about boogeymen, and you know, there's, there's something under the bed, or a spider's going to get you. I do recall after the war having a problem uh, being chased by people. My stepfather wanted to play with me, for example. He would run around the table and I would faint. I could not have anyone running after me. So yes, I, f I learned fear. It's not that anyone injured me physically. I learned fear. I remember uh, the people took me to a church, uh, their church, to uh, normalize the relationship that the child was not Jewish. Uh, of course, it turns out after many years after the war, I learned that most people in town suspected it all along. And uh, there was even a Nazi who told Mrs. Wetzels to keep me, um, to keep that child inside. Um, that he suspected that, that I was Jewish, and he, you know, uh, would maybe have to report me if he, if, if he knew about it. Um, my Jewish identity uh, was not, uh, of course, made evident, but people, although suspected it. Um, I do remember sitting in this church and this bag, pointed bag go over my head where the collection was taken, and it go boing, boing, boing over my head as it went down the row and came back again. Uh, but it was after the war, um, because my p family had been Orthodox Jews, it was expected of me to go to a Jewish school, Cheder, right away uh, from almost when I came back. I was sent to Jewish school, and the Jewish children, came, you know, after the war, started coming back, and uh, those that were left that had been in hiding. Um, so I started Jewish school right away uh, when I was f five or six years old. I was extremely lucky to have had guardian angels, that's how I look, think of them in a way, um, in many different places. Uh, there were always bad people around, who I prefer not to comment on, um, uh, but there were these good people, and I think, uh, and that has sort of carried me through even to today, uh, where uh, I seem to, I feel that somebody's looking after me, over me. I. I'm a strong believer in God, and I think that God looked over, uh, looked over me. And Mrs. Wetzels was an angel because she was the lady who hid me or, or kept me because she had such a responsibility having seven sons and two daughters who were all much older than I, myself. And um, she knew that she was putting her family in great, grave danger. Uh, so I owe her an enormous amount. It was in 1947 uh, that my mother got a letter from Mrs. Wetzel that she really would like to see Ellie again. So my mother put me on a train <laughs> by myself. And this is what people did in those days. They were very trusting. Uh, so I made that voyage by myself. It was about a three-hour train trip from where we were living down to uh, all the way to Mechelen. And I uh, stayed there with them for two days. And I do not remember that visit, actually. Um, but I know it happened in 1947. We came to Canada in 1951. And because uh, the war had been such a disturbance to our family in so many ways, financially and the loss of family, we had to concentrate my parents on making a living and me going to school and fitting in. And so also, I didn't want to think about my past. My past was a scary place, and I didn't want to go back to it, in spite of the fact there had been a very nice lady who had taken care of me. Uh, but somehow I didn't want to think about it. And one day I got a phone call in Ottawa from a man with a very raspy voice, Harry Wetzel's the eldest son. 
and he, it was, I think, in 1989 or so, and he said, Ellie, this is Harry Whistles. My mother wants to see you. Uh, she's 95, uh, whatever age she was, it was in her 90s. And unfortunately, I waited two years, but I did do it. And I, my husband and I went to uh, see her, and I was so grateful because uh, all my bad memories fell away. And I saw her children, they came and they hugged me, and uh, Harry had this home film, and he made this film of us me with a mother, me with the brothers and himself, and he, because they felt I was their sister. You see, I made an impact on them that I didn't realize I had made. The people that are going to be studying this or have studied what happened, they don't have a direct emotional connection, generally speaking, except for, for suppose, Jewish people. Um, but it's very important for people to understand, uh, to learn about what happened to ordinary people who have had actually have done, absolutely have committed no crimes of any t sort, who look physically just like everyone else. Therefore, why isolate them and label them, or uh, think evil of them? Um, it, it is just preposterous that. Uh, others can, uh, people can do these things to each other. And I find it extremely important that uh, children are aware. I think 75% of the kids, at least, that I speak to at school come from war-torn countries. And we have to be sensitive to uh, people that are, are different from ourselves. And we have to understand that they came with baggage, and they will have to be integrated. And the fact they have dark hair or uh, wear head covering doesn't make them evil. It is a f mode of dress. And people uh, should understand that they shouldn't be looking at the exterior package, but rather uh, f decide whether someone has a good personality. And that is what's important.